books guide us along the pathways of the Great War. A recent purchase of a book owned by the author and Great War veteran Henry Williamson has taken me back to my early years of visiting the Somme and my understanding of the old front line through the pages of a writer who first coined that phrase in 1917. When you're fascinated by a subject like the Great War, books are very much an important part of your research. Books give us modern insights from academics. We can read the memoirs of those who were there, regimental accounts, battalion war diaries, war poetry, literature. The list is almost endless. But what you find is that the more that you study the subject, Books are not just the tools by which you gain knowledge. They become tangible, often beautiful objects that you enjoy owning, that you enjoy looking at and holding in your hands and turning the pages. I have a house full of books on military history, in particular, of course, the Great War. Can you have too many books? Well, I would argue no. And for those of us who continue to look for those rare volumes, we often find ourselves dipping in to the catalogues of military booksellers. One I've known for many, many years is Tom Donovan, based in Sussex. And I'll put a link to Tom's website so, like me, you can spend far too many of your pennies on books about the Great War. But a recent list of his came out, which included a large number of titles, many of them quite rare memoirs or contemporary accounts, or famous novels of the period, often first editions in dust wrappers, which, from a value point of view, makes them even more desirable and, of course, costly. But what was interesting is that this was not a collection that had been gathered together by Great War enthusiasts like ourselves. This was a collection that had come from a veteran of the Great War, from the family of a veteran of the Great War, and not just any veteran, a veteran that himself had written a huge number of books connected to the subject of the Great War. And that author, that veteran, was Henry Williamson. Sadly, one of Henry's sons, Richard Williamson, himself a prolific nature writer, has recently passed away, and a huge amount of books connected to his father ended up in the Chichester auction house, and quite a few dealers ended up buying some, but I believe that the vast majority of the books went off to America. There's always been a very big interest in Henry Williamson's writing and his life and his works in America, so that probably explains it. But what it meant was quite a big chunk of the collection of Great War books that had belonged to Williamson ended up on the list of Tom Donovan. I know from Twitter quite a few people ended up buying some, quite a few people that listened to this podcast, I think, and it included me, Having spent such a long time researching Henry Williamson, writing about Henry Williamson, there's a previous podcast episode about Henry Williamson's war, which I'll put a link to on the page for this podcast. Having spent so much time following old Henry around the battlefields of the Great War, and back in the 80s and 90s, I used to travel with my old friend Brian Fulliger and Stephen Clark and Terry Russell, three great Williamson aficionados, both Terry Russell and Stephen Clark had known Williamson, and we used to find that uh, whenever we tramped around the battlefields following Henry Williamson's writing in different places and putting that writing into context by seeing those places as they were today, we often used to see an animal or a bird or a flower or a tree that Williamson had written about, a Fasian bird on Bellawada Ridge, for example, I remember that very clearly, and it always felt as if old Henry was with us somehow. So having a chance to acquire a book that had once belonged, a Great War book that had once belonged to Henry Williamson, that was an opportunity not to be missed. So thanks to the excellent customer service of Tom Donovan, I can't recommend him as a bookseller enough. The book arrived in just a few days, and there I had this precious Great War volume with Henry Williamson's signature in it and some additional notes that he made there in my hands. What book was it? Well, we'll come to that shortly. But first of all, 
for those who are not familiar with Henry Williamson, let's just have a quick recap as to who he was and what his connection to the Great War was as well. Henry William Williamson was born in Brockley in South East London in 1895. His father worked in the city and not long afterwards they moved to Ladywell, just a short distance from Brockley in South East London, where they moved into a house in Eastern Road, a very pleasant little late Edwardian row of houses next to quite a big area of open parkland called Hilly Fields, perched on top of which was a local school, not the school that Williamson himself went to. He ended up going to Colf's Grammar School just down the road. He got a scholarship to it and off he went to Colf's and met many people who would be friends of his for the rest of his life, including Douglas Bell, whose account of the Great War, called A Soldier's Diary of the Great War, was published in the 1920s with an introduction by Henry Williamson. By 1914, Williamson was working in an insurance company in London, but he joined the 5th Battalion of the London Regiment, the London Rifle Brigade, as a territorial soldier before the war. When the war broke out, he was at their annual camp down at Crowborough in Sussex, and the battalion was mobilised. It was one of those territorial battalions that had a very high rate of men who had volunteered for imperial service, and this was an obligation, the imperial service obligation, that was brought in just before the Great War, to enable the War Office to send territorial battalions overseas rather than keep them on garrison duty in Britain. And Williamson's battalion was pretty much fully signed up for that, so it was no coincidence they became one of the first territorial infantry battalions to be sent overseas, in his case in November 1914, and they moved up to the front in Flanders. Williamson was just an 18-year-old rifleman in that battalion at that time, and he served with them in the trenches in the Plugstert or Plug Street sector. In many of his books, he recounts his experiences there in some detail. The damp and trenches full of water, very primitive conditions. He talks about how he cut the bottom of his greatcoat off because he kept trailing in the water, and then there'd be sub zero temperatures and it would freeze solid like a board. So he chopped it off. And indeed, there is a photograph of him as a young rifleman wearing his great coat, and you can clearly see that he's chopped the bottom of it off in that photograph. But in 1914, his most important Great War experience, and in fact really one of the most important experiences of his entire life, was to be in no man's land on Christmas Day. His battalion of the London Rifle Brigade was one of those involved in the Christmas truce. Now, Williamson's grandparents were German, and Williamson spoke German, His house in Eastern Road in Brockley had been called Hildesheim on the outbreak of war, a sign that his father took off the front gate very quickly. Now Britain was at war with Germany. But Williamson was able to converse with the German soldiers that he met, and he he spoke about this experience many, many times. He wrote about it. He broadcast in the 1930s about it on BBC Radio, and then later, during the filming of the BBC Great War series in the 1960s, he was interviewed about it as well, and he appears in that series, and that extract of him talking about the Christmas truce is still on iPlayer and is widely available on YouTube. And again, I'll put a a link to that onto the podcast website. But what was so special about the Christmas truce for Williamson? Well, his battalion had gone to war, blessed by the Bishop of London, who told them that it was a holy crusade of Christianity, the English-speaking world, against the beast that was Germany, and that God was on their side. And there he was on Christmas Day 1914, meeting Germans in no man's land, who, when he asked them what they were fighting for, they said, for Kaiser, for Vaterland und Freiheit, for King, for country and freedom. And... Williamson noted that on their belt buckles was a legend that said, Gott mit uns, God is with us. And for him, and as he said, many of his contemporaries, here was a great contradiction. They'd been told God was on their side. The Germans believed that God was on their side. Whose side was God on? Who here was the righteous one? And this is something that I think troubled Williamson for the rest of his life. Richard, who sadly died this year, stood with me in the area around Plug Street some years ago when we made a battlefield tour following Henry Williamson 
around the First World War battlefield sites where he'd served and which he'd written about. And he related how, for them as young children, Christmas was always not the experience it really should be because his father was often thrown into this black depression remembering Christmas Day 1914. If only the men had stood up to the war and ended the war and walked away from the trenches. He mulled this over in his mind many, many times and it haunted him, really. So that experience in No Man's Land at Plug Street was one of the defining experiences in Williamson's life. There's no doubt about that. Williamson was later commissioned as an officer in the Bedfordshire Regiment and then he transferred to the Machine Gun Corps and he served with them on the Somme front in the cold winter of 1916-17 carrying ammunition and supplies using his donkeys and mules as the transport officer of a machine gun company up towards the front line around Beaumont Hamill. He then served with them in the advance to the Hindenburg line and the battles around Bullecourt in April and May of 1917. Williamson got recurring dysentery in the First World War and in that summer of 1917 he was sent home with a, a second case of it and it appears that he didn't really return to the front again. There is some evidence that he may have come back for a brief period in March 1918 but that appears to have been his last proper frontline service. He ended the war at Fort Langard on the coast seeing flares go up over the sea and men tearing their uniforms off and diving into the water and Williamson said that he sat there morose thinking out to the battlefields now they would be quiet after four years and a single thought goes through his mind and it was that thought that I think really again haunted him for the rest of his life. He sat there and he looked out thinking of the battlefields empty and quiet and silent and the dead lying there in the cemeteries across the battlefields where so many had fought and died. And he thought to himself, never again, never again, it must never happen again. And that, I think, impetus on his part and indeed many veterans for the war to never be repeated for this kind of war to never be repeated was something that drove so many of them and certainly drove Williamson. When he returned home after the Great War, he couldn't really settle into normal civilian life. He often talks about walking the streets of south-east London in the early hours of the morning, unable to sleep, and he built a kind of a dugout in his father's back garden to kind of live in and think about his experiences in the war. But what he wanted to do, what he really wanted to do, was write. And he began that process in the 1920s, leading to the publication of his first proper novel, Tarka the Otter, that won the Hawthornden Prize and suddenly propelled him into some degree of fame. And that led him to write many other nature novels and nature books and books about rural life, particularly in Devon. He fell in love with Devon and moved to Georgium in the early 1920s. The book that I got from Tom Donovan is signed Henry Williamson, Georgium, 1923. And while he lived in many other places, including a long stint as a farmer in Norfolk during the period of the Second World War, Georgium and Devon was his real true love, and after his death in 1977, that's where he was buried, in the churchyard at Georgium. Although many of his interwar period books mention the Great War, there were only two significant volumes that he produced about the Great War at that time. I say only because they're both fantastic books. One of them is Patriot's Progress, a kind of a follow-on to Her Private's We by Frederick Manning. In this case, it follows a young soldier who's conscripted and goes off to fight in the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917 and loses his leg. It was illustrated by some amazing wood engravings that was done by another Great War veteran, William Commode, who accompanied him on a few trips to the battlefields. It's a book that I've read many times, and it's a great story. I've never understood why it's not been dramatised, to be honest, but the real impactful part of the book is definitely those wood engravings. They really are magnificent, and it's worth seeking out an original edition just for that. It's not a rare book or an expensive book, but it's a beautiful book to own. His other book during that period was an account of visiting the battlefields called The Wet Flanders Plain, which chronicled several of his visits to places like Ypres and the Somme and his reflections upon that in the 1920s. But as the 20s moved into the 30s, Williamson's story takes a bit of a dark turn because in the late 30s he joins the British Union of Fascists. He claimed that he joined them, he supported Mosley because of their farming policy, 
it's a bit of a dubious excuse, but it was something that he never really quite relented on. He stayed friends with Mosley for the rest of his life, and he dedicated one of his post-Second World War books to Oswald Mosley, one of the reasons, I suspect, why he was never formally recognised or honoured for his contribution to English literature. So he was a complex man, Henry Williamson, and I'm never going to be one that's ever going to excuse his dance with fascism, far from it, in fact. And he paid for it, really, in his own lifetime from being one of the most popular broadcasters on BBC Radio in the late 1930s when war broke out and he was arrested under Rule 18b because of his involvement with the BUF. He was sidelined and he didn't really have any kind of media career again for some decades He became a farmer in the Second World War and he produced food for the war effort and one of his sons fought, his eldest son fought in the war in Bomber Command. But what Williamson set himself on a path to achieve at this time was to write this incredible war and peace, as he called it, of the period of the First World War. Not just the war itself, but the lead up to the war and the post-war period. And he began writing this after World War II in what became a chronicle of ancient sunlight, 15 novels following roughly the story of his own family from Victorian times through to where the the main character, Philip Madison, just after World War II, declares that he's going to write this series of books. So it's semi-autobiographical, but not entirely. There are lots of it that he changes, and he really kind of fictionalises many aspects of his own life, and trying to pick out the fact and fiction in those books is often quite difficult. But they are a masterpiece of British literature, 15 novels. It's the longest sequence, I think, of any fiction uh, in the history of of English literature. And again, because of his involvement with the BUF, Williamson was never formally recognised for that. The books are still in print, and we'll put a few links to some of these, including the Henry Williamson Society website, where you can get some of the rarer volumes from onto the podcast website. But Williamson kind of had a revival in the 60s with the 50th anniversary of the Great War. He wrote a lot of newspaper articles and again visited the battlefields once more. He appears in the Great War series and he wrote, continued to write into the 70s up until his death in 1977. But interest in his books and and what he did as a writer was quite of a niche thing in many respects. But a Henry Williamson Society was formed in the 1980s and after I first picked up a copy of one of his books, Love and the Loveless, I discovered through our local library, there was a little card up on the the wall there in one of those little pin boards that they used to have in libraries that declared that there was not just a Henry Williamson Society, but one of its members lived in Crawley, where I lived at that time. So I met up with that chap who was Brian Fulliger, who I mentioned earlier in this podcast, who became one of my great battlefield buddies, and we used to walk around the battlefields following old Henry in different places. And that led me on to discover much more about Henry Williamson's life and his writings and acquire many of his books. And also along the way, meet many members of his family, his children, two of his wives, and meet people who knew him. And that was a fascinating kind of insight into the man, the writer and the veteran. And one of the things that I was able to do in the late 80s and early 90s was to visit Georgium a couple of times and see where Williamson did a lot of his writing. Now, later in his life, he had a house built on the edge of Georgium, and that was a kind of a modern 70s, 60s, 70s house. It wasn't a very attractive house, and when I first went there, I think it was a bed and breakfast, but you had to go through part of a, up a pathway that went in front of that house towards what was called the studio. And the studio was just a rough kind of shed, basically, full of Williamson's working library, because he wrote a lot of books and he did a lot of research, both for the nature books and later for his books covering the First World War, for example, and he read profusely on the Great War. And I really wanted to see some of those books that he had used, that he'd read during that period. And so thanks to his son Richard and and Anne Williamson, who was Richard's wife, who was the head of the Henry Williamson estate, and still is as far as I'm aware, I was able to get in there and have a look and there was this amazing collection of really rare First World War books. It was incredible to be able to kind of pull these off the shelf and see sections where Williamson had underlined them in pencil and said Philip Madison says this and Father Aloysius says this, some of the characters from his books and letters would fall out of them. I opened one book and a letter from 
T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, fell out, for example. And so there was this fantastic Great War library, fantastic library of nature writing and nature literature. Richard Jeffries was one of his great favourites, and there's a lot of books about that. And a big chunk of this library was donated to the University of Exeter, where they have a Henry Williamson archive. But it, there were so many books, that obviously the family kept some as well. And I, that is essentially where this collection of books that's come up for sale via the auction house in Chichester and via Tom Donovan, that's where it emanated from. But that's not always where they were all kept. Now, there was a huge library in there, and it couldn't all be kept in one building without being kind of rammed in bookcases and shelves like it was in that studio. But next to the studio was the genesis of that little plot of ground that Williamson had acquired in Georgium, and that was his writing hut. And this was like a big garden shed, an ornate garden shed, that was much more than that. It was a place where he could go and write and kind of live in it, really, because writing is a very solitary thing. You need to lock yourself away and really cut yourself off from the outside world to do your writing, and that's what Williamson did in his writing hut. And as you walked in through the door, and I think I've described this in a previous podcast, when I first went there, his old army boots, his officer's boots, were still sitting by the front door. And there was a fireplace that kept the writing hut warm. And when I walked over to that, there was a little brass ornament on the top, which Richard, his son, said Henry had used for snuffing out candles. And he certainly could do that, but actually what it was was the spike off of a German pickle halber. Perhaps Williamson had picked that up in No Man's Land on Christmas Day. And then there were these bookcases where the books that I'd just seen were once on those shelves, which he'd used for whatever his latest writing project was. And then there was a kind of a little ladder that went up to a sleeping area and a kind of mezzanine floor in the roof where Williamson could sleep while he was staying in there. So it had a huge amount of atmosphere. And although it was empty of books when I first went there, some of the drawers had some of his Great War artefacts in. And I remember opening one of the bookcases and there was a, a newsletter of the old Comrades Association of the 13th Rifle Brigade. Now, Williamson never served with them. Why he was a member of that, I don't know. But perhaps he was sent a review copy of their excellent battalion history and decided to join them as fellow comrades in arms of the Great War. I don't know. I mean, certainly a lot of the books that were in his studio were clearly review copies. He wrote for quite a lot of newspapers in that interwar period, and I guess he was offered a lot of volumes to try and push them on behalf of the publishers and the author. But when I stood there that day in his writing hut, empty of books, Williamson dead for quite some years by then, that chapter of his life, that story ended. I still felt, though, a very, very strong connection in that place to the Great War with his boots by the door and that pickle halber spike on the mantelpiece and almost the ghosts of Williamson's books in the shelves. It was one of the things that I think really spurred me on myself to write about the Great War, to follow that path and to follow people like Williamson around those battlefields because the importance of the landscape of the Great War is something that runs like a thread through all of his work and all of his writings on it. But here we are some way into the podcast and I still haven't told you yet which Williamson book it was that I purchased. So we'll leave Georgium and the writing hut and the studio and the ghosts of Williamson's past behind us for now and in our next section we'll look at that book, what it was, what it tells us and what Williamson did with it. When I looked at that book list of Tom Donovan's and saw those many fine volumes listed which had once been in the studio or in the writing hut, it was hard to choose which of Williamson's books to take away. In some respects it wasn't too difficult because quite a lot of them were very expensive. Understandably so given the rarity of many of them and also their provenance. But what I wanted really from it was not a book that had value, financial value, but a book that, to me, had symbolic value. And as I look through the list, there it was. It was a copy of John Macefield's The Old Front Line. If I was going to buy one book amongst that list, it had to be that one, the book that inspired the title of this podcast. 
John Macefield's book, which is essentially about the Battle of the Somme, was written in 1917. Macefield was already a famous writer at the time of the Great War. A poet laureate, he would go on to write A Box of Delights, which those of you who follow me on social media will know is one of my favourite Christmas stories and one that I watched the 1980s BBC drama version of in the lead up to Christmas every year and a book that I've read countless, countless times. But in 1914, when the war broke out, John Macefield was well over the age for military service, but nevertheless he volunteered and joined a volunteer ambulance unit and came across and worked in a French voluntary hospital, of which there were many behind the French lines in that early period of the Great War, and served with them in 1915, close to the front. So he didn't go into the trenches or go over the top, but what he did see, what he did get, was an insight into the suffering and the consequences of the Great War. And when he returned to England, he was offered a contract to write several books, one on Gallipoli that came out in 1916, which is a good volume. These are wartime books. They, they don't tell you about the conduct of the campaign. They are a writer's perspective on those actions of Gallipoli and then the volume that he would eventually do on the Somme called The Old Front Line. And it became a best-selling book. There are so many editions of it. The edition that I've got that was Williamson's is an early one with a dust wrapper, which I've never had an edition with a dust wrapper on, which has got a, a lovely kind of outline of a star shell exploding over the battlefields. And I'll put some illustrations of what the book and what's in the book on the podcast website. But another connection that I have to Macefield's Old Front Line is a 1970s edition that I got out of the local library and took with me on my first visit to the Somme battlefields 40 years ago in the summer of 1982. There was an edition then that had a foreword by a retired colonel who used to write a column in the military modelling magazine at that time about visiting Great War battlefields some of the kind of early inspiration that I had to do that. And I took this copy with me because it had some then and now photographs of troops working on the main road running through Avalui Wood, for example, and a shot of it today. And when I walked that ground with my father, I had this book with me. So it's a book that's always meant a lot to me. And in fact, the very first website that I published on the internet as early as 1999, inspired by the work of Tom Morgan and his pioneering Hellfire Corner website. And I was delighted to meet Tom in Eat just a few days ago when I was there uh, the other weekend. But inspired by his website, I put a website up about the First World War in the late 90s, which I called The Old Front Line. What else would I call it, this book that had such a, an effect on me? So when I saw it on Tom Donovan's list, a copy that had been owned by Henry Williamson, kind of all, as I often speak about on this podcast, all of those pathways of the Great War seem to come together. Not in a place this time, not in a cemetery, but in a book. And that was the book that I must have, and thankfully it was available. So I've got the book in front of me now, and it's in a dust wrapper, as I mentioned, a pretty tatty dust wrapper. But it's got um, a star shell bursting at night near our lines on the cover. And it's a very faded kind of monochrome image where you can just see the burst of something in the darkness. And it's quite an evocative image of the Great War. And then underneath, The Old Front Line by John Macefield, author of Gallipoli. And when I open the book up, this is the first kind of interesting, but you'll hear a bit of rustling as I take the dust jacket off for a minute. And inside the cover, Williamson has annotated it. He's written his name, Henry Williamson, Georgium, 1923. He's listed underneath some of his books, so The Lone Swallows, The Peregrine Saga, The Old Stag and Tark of the Otter. In, he's grouped them together and said the four early nature books. Then underneath he's written The Village Book and A Labourer's Life. All of these are his kind of classic nature, landscape, Devon books connected with his early writing. And then on the other page he's written 1921 and... Some of his early novels, The Beautiful Years, Dandelion Days, The Dream of Fair Women and The Pathway. And 1930, The Starborn. And then he's continued on between them, The Wet Flanders Plain, which is the book that I mentioned that chronicles his travels around the battlefields of the Great War in that 1920s kind of pilgrimage period. 
And then underneath are the names of three other books, two of which he didn't write. He didn't certainly give them those titles. One's called The Irritable Man, The Lost Horizon, and The Sun in the Sands, which is the book that he did publish. Quite a lot of great war references in that. But he's crossed that out and written, I think later, Ancient Sunlight, which is the title of the 15 novel sequence that he wrote after the Second World War. Now, a lot of Williamson's books and a lot of those that were on sale on Tom Donovan's catalogue had Williamson's little owl stamp that he put in the books. And this is his kind of logo, his cipher, really, that he used and is published in many of his published works. But he had one done that he stamped in his books and often wrote his name underneath. This one is interesting, is that he's actually drawn the owl. It's quite a kind of characterized version of an owl, but it's one that I've seen in some of his letters. So that, for me, was a kind of an extra for this, was rather than just have a stamp in there, Williamson's actually drawn his owl and put HW at its feet. And then on the title page of the book, he's scribbled a few more things and written some book titles down, some of which he used and some of which are different. It seems that he may have used a lot of these books just to write notes in, basically. So he's listed The Beautiful Years, Dandelion Days, The Dream of Fair Women, which are novels that he wrote. And then the fourth of those he's listed as The Bow of Burning Gold or The Bow of Burning Gold, which again is a, a title that he didn't use for a published work. I would guess scholars of Williamson's early writing, of which I would never say that I'm one, I'm more interested in what he wrote about the Great War and his visits along the Great War battlefields, would find these kind of books useful in that respect because it kind of looks at the development of a, of a writer and, and how he changes the names of the books that he's working on. On the title page of the book, we again see The Old Front Line or The Beginning of the Battle of the Somme by John Macefield, author of Gallipoli, etc., illustrated William Heinemann, 1917. And I noticed a detail, which I hadn't noticed in previous copies of this, is that the book is dedicated to Neville Lytton. Now that leapt off the page for me as well, because Neville Lytton was an officer in the South Downs battalions of the Royal Sussex Regiment. In fact, he was one of the original officers of the South Downs, the 11th Battalion, when it was formed by Colonel Claude Lowther in September of 1914. He was a friend of Lowther. He ended up being sent off to the staff, and he wrote a book after the war called The Press and the General Staff, detailing the work that he did with wartime correspondents and probably people like John Macefield. The book is dedicated to him, so that was a kind of nice little connection as well to yet more of those crisscross paths of the Great War. And then when I begin to read this work by Macefield, I realised that when I read it in the 1980s, when I first went to the Somme, I probably thought it was a book written after the war. In fact, I'm sure in the back of my mind that I did. And it does read like that when you read it. It's not really apparent that it is a book written while the war is still on and while the outcome of the war is unknown. It kind of refers back to an event, the Battle of the Somme, as if it is part of history, which, of course, even a year later it would be, but if it's much further back than just a year. So it's interesting in, in that respect, in the way that he wrote about it. And I think essentially what Macefield does in this is that he, he visits the Somme from afar and looks at that line along the Somme front where Britain had gone into battle on the 1st of July 1916 and suffered, as we know, so many casualties, something that possibly even in 1917 when John Macefield wrote this book, that still wasn't as widely known as it is today. Now, Williamson used a lot of these books for his own work he took sections out of so many different books and characters in his novels say these things. And the book, again, which is of interest to me, is heavily annotated by Williamson, where he's underlined passages, he's written a few names in the, the margin to say who, which characters that connected to, and he's then focused on particular sections. And I'm not going to go through all of the parts that he's used or underlined, but there's a few areas that I wanted to read to you, which I think, gives us an insight into why Williamson was drawn to this book and what the book tells us and I think what it still tells us about the Battle of the Somme and the battlefields of the Somme even more than a century after Macefield wrote it and nearly a century now, 1923 is almost a 100 years ago when Williamson was using this book in his little house in Georgium. So this is the opening of Macefield's book, 
and this is the first section that Williamson has marked up in the margin. This description of the old front line as it was when the Battle of the Somme began may someday be of use. All wars end, even this war will someday end, and the ruins will be rebuilt, and the field full of death will grow food, and all this frontier of trouble will be forgotten. When the trenches are filled in, and the plough has gone over them, the ground will not long keep the look of war. One summer with its flowers will cover most of the ruin that man can make, and then these places from which the driving back of the enemy began will be hard indeed to trace, even with maps. It is said that even now in some places the wire has been removed, the explosive salved the trenches filled and the ground ploughed with tractors. In a few years' time, when this war is a romance in memory, the soldier looking for his battlefield will find his marks gone, sent away, Pill Trench, Munster Alley, and these other paths to glory will be deep under the corn, and gleaners will sing at Dead Mule Corner. And when you think that that's the very first paragraph of the book, what resonance that has with us today. For those of us who visited the front only a few times, and others who've been going for many years, we can see the changes on the landscape, we can see how that old front line that Macefield so clearly and definitely establishes in this book, how it's changed. And already in 1917, he's talking of that change. He also hints at loss in the book. There's this paragraph. Very many of our people never lived to know the result of even the first day's fighting. For them, the old front line was the battlefield and the no-man's land the prize of the battle. They never heard the cheer of victory, nor looked into an enemy trench. Some among them never even saw the no-man's land, but died in the summer morning from some shell in the trench and the old front line here described. The book talks about several of the Somme villages, and at the time the Somme front would have been as we see it today, but much more clearly then the definition between departements like the Pas de Calais and the Somme was not really known, so when they spoke about the Somme, it is that common perception of what the Somme is, from Gomacourt to Montabas. And in doing so, he picks on, for example, the village of Hebuturn, and says this. Hebuturn, although close to the line and shelled daily and nightly for more than two years, was never the object of an attack in force, so that much of it remains. Many of its walls and parts of some of its roofs still stand. The church tower is in fair order, and no one walking in the streets can doubt that he is in a village. Before the war it was a prosperous village. Then, for more than two years, it rang with the roar of battle and with the business of an army. Presently the tide of war ebbed away from it and left it deserted, so that one may walk in it now, from end to end, without seeing a human being. It is as though the place had been smitten by the plague. Villages during the Black Death must have looked like this. One walks in the village expecting at every turn to meet a survivor, but there is none. The village is dead. The grass is growing in the street, the bells are silent, the beasts are gone from the byre and the ghosts from the church, stealing about among the ruins and the gardens are the cats of the village, who have eaten too much man to fear him, but are now too wild to come to him. They creep about and eye him from cover and look like evil spirits. And I think with that, even in that kind of aftermath period after the Battle of the Somme has moved away, the armies have advanced or retreated to the Hindenburg line, depending on how you look at it, and this village of Hebuturn is now behind the front when Macefield saw it, it still is a picture of hell, smitten by those evil spirits, something that many veterans would have recognised from that landscape of the war during the war while the conflict was still on. And I like in the book how he refers to the idea of battlefield tourism, of people coming to visit these battlefields or hints at it, thinks that it may come one day and there's this chapter where he describes it in this paragraph long after we are gone perhaps stray english tourists wandering in picardy will see names scratched in a barn some mark or notice on a door some signpost some little line of graves or hear on the lips of a native some slang phrase of english learned long before in the wartime in childhood when the english were there 
All the villages behind our front were thronged with our people. There they rested after being in the line, and there they established their hospitals and magazines. It may be said that men of our race died in our course in every village within five miles of the front. Wherever the traveller comes upon a little company of graves, he will know that he is near the site of some old hospital or clearing station where our men were brought in from the line. And he then takes the reader into the trenches, but he firmly places those trenches on the landscape from the, the point of view, from the eye-level view of the soldiers who were there. The soldiers who held this old front line of ours saw this grass and wire day after day, perhaps for many months. It was the limit of their world, the horizon of their landscape, the boundary. What interest there was in their life was the speculation what lay beyond that wire and what the enemy was doing there. They seldom saw an enemy. They heard his songs and they were stricken by his missiles, but seldom saw more than perhaps a swiftly moving cap at a gap in the broken parapet or a grey figure flitting from the light of a star shell. Aeroplanes brought back photographs of those unseen lines. Sometimes, in raids in the night, our men visited them and brought back prisoners, but they remain mysteries and unknown. And I guess when you read that and think about the experience of soldiers in the line, they saw their own little world. They saw that world in and around their trench, their wire, their no-man's land, they saw nature stretching across that shell-smashed ground, the birds above the battlefield, the skylarks, and they knew that there were men on their side of the line, but also there was the enemy. And how did the enemy, the unseen enemy, fit into all that? There's so much in this book that makes you think about not just the Battle of the Somme, but the wider experience of the men who were there. And halfway through the book, he moves on to one of the most iconic Somme villages, Tiapval or Thiepval, as the troops often called it, and he says, It is worth while to clamber up to Thiepval from our lines. The road runs through the side of the village in a deep cutting, which may have once been lovely. The road is reddish with the smashed bricks of the village. Here and there in the mud are perhaps three courses of brick where a house once stood, or some hideous hole bricked at the bottom for the vault of a cellar. Blasted, dead, pitted stumps of trees with their bark in rags grow here and there in a collection of vast holes, ten feet deep and fifteen feet across, with filthy water in them. There is nothing left of the church, a big reddish-brown mound of brick that seems mainly powder round a core of cement, still marks where the chateau stood, the chateau garden, the round village pond, the pine trees, which was once a landmark there, are all blown out of recognition." And Williamson has marked some of these paragraphs, I think not so much just to use in his own work, but because they reflected his own war experience. He spent that winter of 1916-17 in the Ancre Valley and would have seen Thiepval on many occasions as he took his mules up towards the front-line positions. He would have known that ground. And those conditions described by Macefield would have been very apparent to him as he saw the smashed landscape where the Battle of the Somme had taken place. He had not fought in it as such himself. He'd arrived at the very end of it with his machine gun company in the 62nd West Riding Division, who had only just come to the front at that stage. But he saw the outcome of the Somme, the outcome of the Somme that Macefield describes in this book, which is perhaps why Williamson was so drawn to it. The book dips in and out of different parts of the Somme. It speaks of La Boiselle and Fricourt, and if you've never read John Macefield's The Old Front Line, I would thoroughly recommend it. You can get a wartime copy of it very cheaply in places like eBay. And there are some reprints. I think Pen and Sword have done a recent one. But it's a book that's worth reading. It will not give you great tactical or strategical or even massively historical background to the Battle of the Somme. It will give you an impression of one man and his impression of what was then the old front line to the generation of the Great War, and which remains the old front line that we all visit today. But the book ends with the attack on the Somme, with the 1st of July, and this is what he says. It was fine, cloudless summer weather, not very clear, for there was a good deal of heat haze and of mist in the nights and early mornings. It was hot, yet brisk during the days. 
The roads were thick in dust. Clouds and streamers of chalk dust floated and rolled over all the roads leading to the front, till men and beasts were grey with it. At half past six in the morning of the 1st of July, all the guns on our front quickened their fire to a pitch of intensity never before attained. Intermittent darkness and flashing so played on the enemy line from Gomacor to Maricor, so that for one instant it could be seen as a white rim above the wire, then some coma of a big shell struck it fair and spouted it black aloft. Then another and another fell, and others of a new kind came and made a different darkness, through which now and then some fat white wreathing devil of explosion came out and danced. Over all the villages on the field there floated a kind of bloody dust from the blasted bricks. In our trenches after seven o'clock on that morning, our men waited under a heavy fire for the signal to attack. Just before half-past seven, the mines at half a dozen points went up with a roar that shook the earth and brought down the parapets in our lines. Before the blackness of their burst had thinned or fallen, the hands of time rested on the half-hour mark, and along all that old front line of the English there came a whistling and a crying. The men of the first wave climbed up the parapets in tumult, darkness, and the presence of death, and having done with all pleasant things, advanced across no man's land to begin the Battle of the Somme. Macefield's book is an intensely moving, beautifully written book, and I can see why Williamson was drawn to it, and why it was part of his library, and I'm so pleased to have a bit of that library in mind now amongst the other books of his that he's written. One way or another, we're all kind of obsessed with the Great War to a lesser or greater degree. It's what brings us to it. It's what compels us to return time and time again. And we find in the pages of books by writers like Macefield and Williamson so many stories that inspire us to return, to understand more, and to revisit that ground that Macefield so carefully curated in the pages of that book published in 1917, that book that for the first time chronicled the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Frontline Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.